Okay, so I'm going to be talking about, uh, or my research talk is entitled, Building Bridges with Isotopes, Understanding of the World and Community Through Isotope Research. So the first uh, two thirds of the talk is going to be focused on the research projects that I'm starting. Um, and then the last third is how we're also intentionally incorporating community building and inclusion within STEM research to try and change the face of who is doing science. Um, it's essentially continuing on a lot of the stuff that I got to do in DARE and the feelings that I developed uh, in my graduate education here at Stanford into my postdoctoral work. Um, as some of you who remember me, I didn't work with snails before I went down to UCLA. Uh, this talk is going to be focused a lot on snails and the work I'm doing with snails. Interesting little switch over of work I do. Okay, so outline for today, uh, background and intro to clumped isotopes, uh, going over the two, two of the, snail, or the projects that I'm working on, uh, looking at clumped isotope systems within snails in, at the LA basin level, so a regional level, and then also doing more of a cheap way of doing a lab experiment by stealing samples from zoos and aquariums and trying to look at them at a much more like lab level. And then lastly, uh, talking about uh, diversity. So our lab is an isotope geochemistry lab that's smacked up with a paleoclimatology lab. And so a lot of the work we're doing is we're using isotope geochemical uh, measurements to better understand paleoclimatology and paleo, uh, paleo ecosystems. So here we have the warming out of the last glacial maximum, a stereotypical environment, and we're trying to understand what, what was the plant ecosystem here, what was the water balance, what was the temperature change, so that we can better understand as ecosystem or as climates change, how do ecosystems respond to that? Um, for those of you who know Danny Barra, he does work similar to this uh, using different types of proxies. Uh, this is his work looking at uh, the extent of different lakes in the western United States between uh, at different times in the past, like the last glacial maxima and the mid Pliocene. So for our lab, we use what are called clumped isotopes. Who here has ever heard of the idea of clumped isotopes? Can I see hands? All right, that is way more than most times <laughs> I talk about these. So clumped isotopes is really the idea that we're, we're looking at how heavy carbon and heavy oxygen clump together within the carbonate, uh, well, we actually measure the CO2, but within carbonate materials. So we're measuring this isotope log of C13, 18O, uh, 16O. And this, the prevalence of this isotope log within a material is driven by the temperature of its formation. So essentially, the heavier isotopes have a preference for each other in forming bonds. And the colder it is, the more you actually can see that preference play out in the end material. The hotter it is because there's so much more energy in the system, the difference in bonding strength between heavy heavy and light heavy or light light is much smaller, so you don't see as much uh, 47 isotope log showing up. So from that, that means we can make these fun little graphs where you have temperature on the x-axis, or I've not really, still, I've been in the lab for a year, no one can explain to me why besides the fact that they want it to be linear, that you actually skip, uh, plot it in this uh, frame, but this is the 10 to the six over temperature squared is what they always use, versus the prevalence of the 47 isotope log in the mineral. To get this uh, cat 40, or the 47 measurement, Essentially, we digest uh, the mineral, so in this case, we're using carbonates, so limestone, snail shells, tufa, any carbonate material uh, we can use. We're producing CO2 gas. We're then uh, purifying it and cleaning it of any water or any other uh, nitrous oxides. 
um, and then measuring it on a mass spectrometer, which is measuring the ratios between 47, 45, 44, and 49. Um, eventually, I think there are people are hoping that they will be able to use e the even less prevalent, uh, doubly uh, substituted, so all heavy oxygen, all heavy carbon, which should give you an even more precise temperature, but that's getting past the analytical limits of the machines we're currently using. So where do we get the samples from that we're measuring the CO2? Uh, different sources, um, we either can synthetically make them to really understand within the lab what is the relationship, so we make synthetic carbonates. Um, when we're going out into the field, we're getting things, if we're in marine settings, there are forearms and diatoms. We can go out to uh, alkaline lakes and get tufas, or actually lakes in any dry region where you have shorelines and uh, inorganic carbonates are building up, so tufa rocks. Gastropods like snails, mollusks also produce carbonate shells, and then soils. Um, this was actually what drew me to the lab, uh, working on soils. Um, we have two papers in review now looking at that, but today, and the thing that I've gotten multiple uh, undergrads and some postdocs excited about is looking at this gastropod, looking at snail, especially the snails, um, and how they actually incorporate environmental data into their shells. So, here we have the calibration again, where we have this cool relationship between CAT 47, so the 47 prevalence, and temperature. Um, and we have different materials, so inorganic carbonates, corals, fish otoliths. And it actually forms like a pretty neat line when you're looking at it in, the, in a larger context. But once you really start to like zoom in and see how those different calibrations work. If you break them apart by different materials, you actually get different calibration lines. So one of the things that the field is really trying to do right now is understand what is the actual relationship of, say, snail shell 47 to temperature. And so we really understand when we're looking into the paleo environment, what are we actually measuring? Are we measuring, say, snail, or are we measuring temperature? Are we measuring species a little bit? Are we measuring perhaps eco or niche and habitat preference? Or are we actually getting that environmental signal that we think we're getting? So, like I said, I'm going to be focusing on gastropoda, specifically snails for this one. And we're attacking this from three different levels. The global, which I'm not going to talk about today, because that's really being led by a postdoc. The regional and the lab level. Uh, a quick gratuitous plug for the postdoc that is working with me. If you're going to AGU, Haley Bricker, poster uh, 13F, 1385. She'll be talking about her work doing a modern calibration across the globe of using different snail samples, and then also trying to do some uh, LGM, so last glacial maximum measurements with those and see if she can really start to tease that apart. You should check it out. Also, if you're looking perhaps for a grad student in the coming years, maybe talking to her. She's pretty smart, pretty quick. <laughs> All right, that's about so fun. All right, so <laughs> for the regional snails at the LA Basin. So LA is an interesting place um, not just culturally, but also geographically. You move from very uh, coastal influence, ocean influence, cool weather, cool wet weather along the uh, coastline into in eastern parts of the LA basin, very dry, very hot weather. And it's small enough that you have a pretty strong gradient across a small area, so there's snail species that we're pretty sure encompass the whole region, but are living just here, and then other ones living just here. And we're trying to see if we can, in this regional level, tease out the environmental differences that the snails are picking up. Um, we're also adding onto this an interesting little environmental genetics research. So uh, as Rosemary said, my fellowship is NIH funded, and the people who run the fellowship 
are constantly on me of like, Jesse, when are you going to do some DNA work? When are you going to do some DNA work? <laughs> like, you deal with soils and snails, but we're funding you for biomedical research. And I was like, yeah, that was your decision. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're also looking to see, is there a temperature signal that we're seeing in the snails that we collect across the basin? Is there also genetic variation that we're seeing? And we're really hoping that we're not going to see a correlation between genetic variation and CAP47, either uh, CAP47 values or their temperature impact. Because if we see that, then that implies that genetic variation could actually be what we're, where it throws in another variable for what is controlling the, um, the temperature values that we're seeing. Are we actually measuring temperature changes in the past, or are we measuring genetic population changes? Which would be cool, but they're telling us something different. Okay. And then at the lab culture level, this is sort of two prongs. One is we want to culture the snails ourselves in the lab. I have a number of undergrads who are really excited about raising snails, like, oh, they're going to be so cute. <laughs> they keep forgetting at the end of it we kill them. <laughs> and it's like, there's a, an end result that we get data from their shells, but we do have to kill them. Um, and so we raise the snails at set temperatures with set isotopic water, and then we're able to see what comes out the other end in their 47, 18O, and uh, 13C values that we measure. On top of this, what we're trying to do is partner with different zoos and aquariums around the country to try and collect snails. Because if you've ever been to, say, like a zoo's um, lizard hut or a zoo's like a rat, uh, different exhibits, they usually are keeping the temperature of their enclosures for their invertebrates at constant temperatures. They are people who know what species they have. And so like, oh, well, we don't have to do the work of raising them. We just go and get snails from them when they die. They have all the environmental data associated with it, and we work from there. We can't uh, control for the water input, but we are pretty certain that we can go off of what they're feeding them to at least get the 13 C. Uh, so that's the projects I'm working on. And eventually, the hope is that I can find snails that relate to a time of this paleo environment, and then work out the actual temperature and climate of that so that we can better understand climate to uh, ecological shifts. So all of this is happening in, and Rosemary, I'm sorry, I actually only gave you one of my fellowships. I'm also a Center for Diverse Leadership and Sciences fellow. So what's the acronym for that? CDLS. <laughs> that one's not NIH funded, so it doesn't have to be like a real weird word that works out. Um, and so, if you've worked at all in the School of Earth Sciences here, you know we have all these outreach projects and we have like CSER and SURGE and really intentionally trying to increase diversity and opportunities within the science. And this is functionally the same idea at UCLA with some differences of trying to incorporate more of step ahead mentors within labs. So grad students who are slightly ahead, mentoring undergrads and postdocs, also incorporating team science and really, um, in really trying to enhance students' identity as scientists while also validating their identities as people of color, women, and LGBT community members who do have a place within the scientific community especially in the geology community, which unfortunately is not always welcoming. To that end, even more shameless plugging, we have multiple posters <laughs> and talks at AGU this coming winter. Uh, if you want, I'm going to actually uh, plug this one. This is mine. So geoscientists are human too. Increasing inclusivity in geosciences through empathy building conversations with what we call diversity. And so this is essentially a seminar series slash talk series where we encourage students to come and discuss different topics of diversity, such as the gender gap in achievement, um, issues of privilege within uh, your classroom space, and it gives people who may not have a chance to voice concerns or 
comments or just be able to tell their story, a place to tell their story and feel part of a community, part of the broader geology community. And it also gives mentors and advisors a chance to come and witness and build empathy for their students, which they often want to do but don't know of the setting in which they can participate and not feel that they are, by issues of power imbalance, preventing the students to feel like they can have their authentic voice. And with that, I want to thank my lab and the different fellowship groups that are funding me, and questions. I think I got it like almost good. on the nose. Really good. <laughs>
So our approach then is to go out into the rivers and collect water and sediment samples and bring it back to the lab and analyze them. So we culture the organisms that we're studying, these nitrate oxidizing bacteria, can take several years sometimes to grow them. And then when we have them in culture, we can do physiology experiments and say, how do they respond to certain conditions like temperature or pH or certain pollutants and so forth. With those cultures then, we can sequence their genomes and understand the metabolic potential. So we can see every single gene on that entire genome and what these organisms are capable of doing in the, um, in the environment. With then our genomes and our culture-based physiology work, then we can make hypotheses about what's happening back in the river and we can design experiments where we go back to the river sediments and river water and then see what, uh, what types of metabolisms are happening. This is a map um, uh, showing just a couple of our study sites in Colorado. Down in this region, we have Denver, which is a large me metropolitan area, and we get a large array of urban contaminants in, those, in the rivers of those regions, from wastewater treatment plant effluent and also from urban stormwater drainage that runs right into the rivers. Um, and then as we move northeast, as the rivers flow up from Col uh, Denver, toward, they enter more of an agricultural region. Up there in that region, we get a lot of plant-based agriculture and also a lot of animal feeding operations. So both of those um, have their own suite of contaminants that ultimately runs off and enters the river. So we're working from an urban to agricultural gradient um, in this system. So what did we find? We went out to the river, we collected water and sediment, we grew the bacteria and wanted to see what we had for this particular group, this nitrate oxidizing group. This is showing the different nitrate oxidizers that have been found. In blue and purple are um, Nitrobacter and Nitrospira. So all the studies that look at freshwater systems always find these two groups, Nitrobacter and Nitrospira. So we thought we'd find the same thing. We were really surprised to see that instead we have this orange group called Nitrotoga. Nitrotoga previously had been discovered, um, study, there were five species documented in the whole genus. And they were from places like coastal sands and permafrost and activated sludge. So we were surprised to see, okay, we've got Nitrotoga in these river systems. This was the first, our study was the first um, cultured organism for, uh, of Nitrotoga in freshwater systems. We also sequenced the genomes of those organisms and had the first reported genomes of the, in the entire genus. So that was really interesting and gave us a chance to dive deep into figuring out what these organisms are capable of doing. We looked at the protein involved in oxidizing nitrate, so this key protein in the metabolism, and wanted to understand how it was related to other known NOE. So the purple is our um, nitrospire group, and the blue is our nitrobacter group, the common freshwater organisms. And we then plot <coughs> our protein on top of that. And in orange, we have our, our nitrotoga nitrate oxidizing gene, um, or protein. And you can see that it's very distinct. Just um, on this plot, the length of the line matches the evolutionary distance between these groups. So our organism had this really different protein, which suggests then that nitrate oxidation evolved separately in this group. So nitrate oxidation, um, we had a separate evolutionary event that um, brought nitrate oxidation to this group. Structurally, we see that the protein is a little bit different also, which may impact its um, kinetics and um, metabolism and so forth. Okay, uh, so we were interested in then, did we find this random organism in our cultures, or is it really important, actually important in the environment? So we went back to our river samples and saw, yes, indeed, it's present in 85% of our river samples, along with some of those other known organisms. We also wanted to look globally. Is this a random Colorado thing maybe, or is it more important in, uh, in the globe? So we went to public databases and looked for sequences that were related to our organism. And we saw that, yes, indeed, it's probably hard to see with the lighting here, but all these little colored circles are places where we found our nitrotoga organisms spread around the earth. And, um, and, yet, and we sh sh saw that they were found in all continents, from the tropics um, uh, to the poles. And then we see them in all sorts of different types of environments, fresh water, as well as wastewater treatment plants, soil, sediments, all sorts of stuff. 
So they seem to be globally important, um, and yet they were previously understudied. Nobody really looked for them when they went out in the environment. They were looking for those two other groups. So now we're showing that, yes, indeed, we need to consider these groups um, when we're out interested in understanding nitrogen signal. OK, so with that, then, we have this new group of organisms. We wanted to then go back to our river systems and understand what the influence of antibiotic pollution is. We're looking at other areas of environmental change, but what I'll talk about here is just antibiotics. In Colorado rivers, antibiotic pollution is, a, is an important um, uh, issue because we have antibiotics entering in both urban and agricultural settings. In urban areas, antibiotics enter through wastewater treatment plant effluent, and then in agricultural areas, we get runoff from both, um, again, plant-based and animal-based agriculture systems. When humans or animals take antibiotics, most of it washes out in your urine, which ultimately makes its way to the river. Antibiotics are taken to kill bacteria, right? You're sick with strep throat or something, you take antibiotics to kill that bacteria. When it washes out and ultimately ends up in the river, presumably the <coughs> hypothesis is that that antibiotic would then also impact the bacteria in the river. We're talking about low doses of antibiotics, but it's constant exposure over time. So we wanted to know, does that antibiotic, once it enters the river, also kill the bacteria in the river and therefore disrupt this balance of this critical ecosystem function? We worked with the EPA to quantify how abundant antibiotics were in the river. And um, we see that there's a broad array of antibiotic classes that are found um, in our, some of our river sites. The, the plots missing data were just where mid data wasn't collected. So where you see the dots is where data was collected. And you can see most of the sites and time points have significant amounts of antibiotics from several different classes. So antibiotic pollution is significant across all of the sites in our, um, in our region, including those, um, in addition, um, uh, other sites that aren't listed here. We see antibiotics persisting over the year and lots of different types of antibiotics, which creates this an interesting combination of chemistry going on. Okay, so we then went to our cultures, our new nitrate oxidizing bacterial cultures, and said, can I still oxidize nitrate? when we um, uh, treat them with antibiotics found in the rivers. So we took that river and data and brought um, four classes of antibiotics over three different concentrations. And what I'm showing here is nitrite over time. And so this is our culture consuming nitrate through its natural metabolism over time. In all cases, um, all different, for all the four antibiotic classes, our organism was totally happy. It didn't mind that antibiotic treatment. It was still capable of oxidizing nitrate, even in the presence of antibiotic. So this tells us that, that um, prior antibiotic exposure in the river, that they've developed some resistance to it, and they're capable of still performing their metabolism, even with antibiotic pollution. Um, we went then to the river and um, wanted to test what's happening in the river. So in the culture, it's working fine, um, but what, what about when we get out to the river system? These plots are ugly, I apologize, it's brand new data, um, but we did um, incubation experiments with sediments and river water, and we see the same thing where we get nitrate consumption over time in our sediments. So even at antibiotic um, exposure a 100 times greater than what they're used to seeing in the river, they're still happy oxidizing nitrate and can perform this ecosystem service. Our river water um, remained flat, so they weren't able to oxidize nitrate. We thought we were being clever when we designed our experiments and we went out um, to 72 hours where most of the time these studies happen for 24 to 48 hours. But we may have just missed our period. Perhaps this river water would have started to oxidize nitrate over um, the next you know, 80 or 96 hours or something like that. So unfortunately, we just can't tell with this negative result in the river water. And maybe they can't with oxidize nitrate, or maybe they just needed a little bit more time. Nonetheless, our sediment data tells us that even with antibiotic pollution in the rivers, they're still able to maintain this ecosystem service and remove nitrate to make nitrate, nitrate, and therefore create this balance in the ecosystem. 
So, um, so far our data is suggesting that the river is resilient, that these organisms can withstand antibiotics and likely have antibiotic resistant genes that are capable of um, supporting that system. So finally, in conclusion, we, we see that we have this new group of organisms, Nitrotoga. They're important in rivers, but they're also broadly important globally and therefore need to be considered in future studies. Um, they have a really divergent um, uh, evolutionary history and gained nitrate oxidation separate from the other organisms that we know of. They're really um, resilient and tolerant of a wide range of conditions, and in addition to the antibiotics, also a wide range of temperatures and pHs and so forth. Our future work then is going to really dive into this antibiotic resistant and cycling story. So we want to know which organisms in the river are resistant to antibiotics and which ones um, and still performing nitrogen cycling. Is there functional redundancy there or is it uh, where we get lots of organisms doing the same antibiotic resistant and cycling? Or do we have just certain members that are antibiotic resistant and are taking over and performing the service for the, for the broader group? So finally, I just really want to thank my lab group who has performed much of the work that I presented today. They, um, they um, are the workhorses. I'm just the one that is presented and our funding sources. And thank you guys for your attention. I'd love to take any questions. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I feel like I know most of you. I've, so I graduated only just about a year ago. Um, and I'm now working at the Belfer Center at Harvard, which is a science policy think tank. And um, I'm going to be talking to you guys now about one of my policy-based projects there. Um, this is a pretty new project that you guys are actually the first people to get to see sort of what I'm thinking about here. So um, I hope you enjoy. Um, so the title is Nuclear Waste Management in the Near Term. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. It's probably not surprising to some of you that I'm continuing to look at nuclear waste. So for those of you who don't know me, basically I, I show this to say like th this is kind of my path towards being at Harvard now. Um, the top picture is the nuclear power plant that I grew up about 10 miles from. So I was always sort of thinking about uh, the fact that there was this reactor plant nearby and what did that actually mean. Some people cared a lot about it, some people didn't care at all. Um, where I first did uh, engineering research sort of work, uh, fundamental science was at Notre Dame and that's the second picture. Um, then I went with Rod to do, uh, start graduate school at the University of Michigan, uh, the building formerly known as C.C. Little Building, and uh, that's the picture there. Uh, and at Stanford, when I came with Rod, so that's the fourth and fifth picture, so what I'm showing is actually in Cena Hall, maybe you guys have been over there, that's where the Center for International Security and Cooperation is hosted, which Rod is the co-director of. And so when I was there, I started thinking a lot about not just the technical questions surrounding nuclear energy or nuclear weapons or nuclear technology generally, but the policies, um, political sort of impacts that uh, affect these issues and their overlap or lack thereof. Um, and that led me to pursue this postdoc at the Welfare Center, which is in Cambridge. So uh, basically, I would consider myself someone who studies the environmental impacts of nuclear energy. So why? Um, really like this diagram because it sort of clearly shows you know, the electricity producing uh, systems on one side or energy producing systems on another and then uh, what sectors they go to. And you can see that uh, renewable energy, so this is a dated graph, but nuclear energy and like all the renewable sources kind of make up the same share of the pie with nuclear energy going 100% to electricity. So there are about 30 countries right now who have nuclear reactors and more are showing interest. Um, and so, you know, this is a pretty significant source of, of energy that could make a difference, right? Some people argue that it could make a difference in terms of climate change. But just because it doesn't have, you know, a lot of CO2 emissions doesn't mean it's without environmental impact. There are actually, you know, three really unique environmental impacts to nuclear energy. Um, and one of, is, you know, the potential for catastrophic accidents like at Fukushima, at Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, et cetera. These are you know, very low probability events, but when they happen, it's very catastrophic for the area surrounding it and subsequent radiation release that can happen. Um, another, which I didn't really talk about at Stanford at all, but this is now one of my projects at Harvard, is the potential for nuclear weapons proliferation from the same sorts of technologies that uh, people use for nuclear energy as well. So that's an environmental impact. And also the last one, which I'll talk about today, is the intense difficulty of nuclear waste. 
So um, I, you know, I wasn't sure who would be here. I think you were all mostly at my defense talk, so I won't talk about this. Um, but you know, so I've worked on these issues from technical perspectives in the past, uh, sort of looking loosely at the nuclear waste management, the types of materials that would be possible, um, whether they'd be suitable, and also looking at sort of exotic actinide materials that could be relevant in nuclear accident scenarios. Uh, but my two projects at Belfer are uh, here. So I can talk about this one in Q&A if you'd like. I'm going to focus more on this one. So I will say briefly, the question here is just how do innovative nuclear fuel cycle technologies affect the non-proliferation question? So I'm looking at technologies like laser enrichment of uranium, um, small modular types of reactors, um, looking at additive manufacturing and 3D printing, and different sort of advanced fuel cycles. And the project I'm going to talk about today are is how do nuclear waste management organizations worldwide sort of consider the near-term future in terms of the next 300 or so years of nuclear waste management as opposed to the far term, like a million years from now, when they're siting, designing, building, licensing, and operating geologic repositories. So I will give you some context. For those of you who don't know, um, inside you know nuclear reactor, uh, this is the reactor in mass level. You have a lot of reactions taking place. You have neutron sending fuel, which ultimately cause either fission or absorption, and then uh, transmutation to other elements. So the makeup in China, uh, the makeup inside of spent nuclear fuel is not just one atom, or one isotope, or even a couple, but really it's all of these. So this is a picture of the um, mass number of fission fragments versus the percent yield. And so you can see that you have the whole scale from 70 to 170 represented, which is this whole area inside the periodic table. So when you're dealing with nuclear waste, you're not dealing with just one element, you're dealing with a lot. So I think, you know, in geochemistry, like, personally, I found it difficult to write one reaction for, <laughs> like, a mineral in ocean water, but imagine if you're dealing with all of these, right? So um, this is a very non-trivial issue. So historical endeavors to manage nuclear waste uh, were not pretty. Uh, so one that people a lot of times don't know about is that we actually dispose of nuclear waste off the coast of near here, near the Fairland Islands, in an area where uh, the ocean floor drops off very deep. And so we actually dock two meters there. Uh, and then also, a lot of you have probably heard of the Hanford site. So this is like the largest EPA Superfund site in the country. Uh, it's along a major river. All these cities are impacted by the fact that we eventually, you know, originally put nuclear waste in these like tanks, put them shallowly underground, and just left them there, hoping that that would hold for a while. And the important part is that like all of these e efforts um, have had radiation releases, right? So this isn't really affecting us, the Fairlong Islands endeavor, but this Hanford is certainly affecting these and will continue to do so. Um, but so in the 50s, actually, people, uh, a lot of geologists were involved in this, like recognized that this was going to be an issue. And the National Research Council convened and said, OK, how are we going to deal with this? Um, it was at Princeton University. It had a sort of multidisciplinary, but mostly technical audience. And they ultimately said, in very strong language, that um, we should have, you know, very isolated, the waste should be isolated for a very long time. So there were different things at the time. So in context, so now we don't build nuclear weapons anymore. At the time, we were building up stockpiles of nuclear weapons, so we were doing a lot of different sorts of configurations of reactors. Nuclear power was not commercial to the extent that it is today. We still were just you know, using it to build weapons. And the primary isotopes of concern were strontium-90 and cesium-137, which have much shorter half-lives than what we uh, deal with in the nuclear fuel now. But essentially, uh, you know, they very, very strongly said, you know, we have to take care of this. And there were some recommendations. Um, I have these quotes if you want to read them. But um, so a few things came out of this, which I think are of interest to geologists, right? So first they were like, hey, we should continue to store and say tanks. That's the best option we have right now. But ultimately, disposal in sort of a salt, uh, salt uh, geologic repository would be most promising in terms of isolating the space. Um, and then they came up with some other ideas, like stabilization Stabilization of the waste in slag or ceramic material, um, disposal in porous beds, stratified with impermeable beds, um, and then you know they talk about maybe okay, so if we move these, remove these isotopes from the waste, if we separate them out, maybe that would help, but we'd still have to ultimately dispose of everything. And then they put some pragmatic 
notes here, like we should also consider the storage time that is needed, the transportation, the costs, um, and things like that. Um, and then the final one was, <laughs> please stop dumping in the beta stone, basically. Um, so, you know, promptly after this, the U.S. attempted, you know, the U.S. really did attempt to try and figure this out. Um, and the most famous enduring attempt is the one at Yucca Mountain, which is, depending on who you talk to, it's either failed or it's stalled. It's certainly not uh, moving forward, right? So it was originally one of several sites being considered for a repository and then politically became the sole designated site without approval really of the community or any necessarily technical basis for doing this. Um, and because of that, it's, it's, it had very sustained opposition against it, while at the same time sort of moving forward with the plan to host waste there. Um, so there were some things that happened, which was that in 1985, the National Academy of Sciences said this has to be a compliant repository for a million years. Um, and then in 2009, the official release standards were amended and then like recommended, and that is what sets the standard in terms of whether this repository is functioning. Um, and in 2008, they did submit a license, license application, but in um, 2010, the license application was pulled under President Obama uh, with prejudice, I think is the phrase they used. Um, and you know, they said this is off the table, it's not workable, um, and now the update is that, of course, probably because President Obama pulled it, President Trump <laughs> wants to like, re sort of push forward on this process. Um, so the result of this is that, you know, a lot of people think that, okay, we don't have a repository right now, like that doesn't mean anything, but what it effectively means is that all of the nation's nuclear waste from uh, nuclear power plants is currently stored on the sites of these plants across the United States. And here's a map of where they are. This is the NRC map as of September. So all of these sites all over the country have uh, very radioactive waste in sort of uh, areas that are not designed for permanent disposal. That's clearly a risk. So um, even though Yucca Mountain has sort of stalled, failed, whatever, um, there were certainly some lasting impacts which affect how we think about waste management today and how other countries think about waste management. And here are the ones that I find are pretty significant. So the first is whether how we measure whether a repository is doing its job. Um, so there are a lot of ways you could measure this, right? And the main one that was actually very contentious was looking at radiation release standards. So how many millirem per year does a person, a theoretical person, 10,000 or 100,000 years in the future receive if they're you know, near this race of repository? Um, and then how to prove that compliance, right? So during the siting period, during the point where you're trying to convince the community to accept this repository, you know, how do you show them? So you know, a lot of things were done, but a lot of it technically was sort of showing them models, probabilistic risk assessments, et cetera, and saying, look, you know, all of these 300 models have shown that there won't be a radiation release 10,000 years in the future that is above this threshold. Um, and it was, you know, that was sort of the extent of engagement. Um, and then also, as you would expect, so if you're telling a bunch of people who are not necessarily scientists, like, hey, please have this radioactive waste in your community for a million years, but I promise the person 10,000 years from now like, won't get cancer. Um, <laughs> that doesn't go over well. And so a major point has been how to get communities to actually accept a nuclear waste repository as an acceptable risk in their community and um, not hold up this process. And so now, you know, we've had a lot of recommendations for an iterative, adaptive, consent-based siting repository approach. Um, so what factors impact community acceptance? So one is that, you know, there aren't really any operating repositories for spent nuclear fuel right now. So this would be the first. Any community that has it would be the first. So you're to give you this in a sense. Another is you know the usefulness of models or risk assessments in talking to people in sort of plain language and showing showing them like, hey, this will be safe. It doesn't matter. Um, another one that you hear a lot of times is that sometimes people think that you know if you have a nuclear waste repository, that's implicitly a pro-nuclear power statement. Um, that if you have a repository, you're enabling more waste to be created, which is actually you know may be true pragmatically, but ultimately the waste exists, so it has to be taken care of regardless of whether we continue to do nuclear power. Um, a lot of people think you know, what, it's an unfair burden the way the system is set up, and that you know, one, one community would have the entire country's waste, um, or this is also sometimes conflated with the whole like, not in my backyard stance. Um, there's certainly in the US been citing, citing bias in terms of like which, which community was ultimately chosen, or which state was ultimately chosen. Um, people argue that there's 
organizational bias in terms of like how the risk assessments are, uh, are conducted, what the results show. But also I think just this absurdity of, and we talked a lot about this at CSAC, the absurdity of like a million year contract. If you're talking to people and saying like, hey, please take this, it'll be fine for a million years. Do, do people actually care about that? You know, is that really a compelling thing? You know, I mean, we, a lot of us here worry about climate change, right? That's coming up, right? That's happening now. And people still are sort of like, well, I don't care, right? So how do you get people to care about something that's going to happen a million years from now and, or, you know, be relevant a million years from now in a hypothetical society or a hypothetical community that maybe doesn't exist? So the project I'm working on now is uh, aimed at sort of looking at this in a different way. So I'm asking sort of the question of, you know, if we consider the operational periods of a repository, so the next hundred or so years where you're loading waste into the repository, you have people actively working at the site, the government structures are likely to be the same um, as when the repository was created, um, and maybe the period after immediate sealing or closure of a repository, where you have more sort of graspable consequences for the communities who are giving their consent for this repository. Um, how do organizations essentially consider or neglect this time period? Um, and how should they consider or neglect this time period? Uh, both in a technical sense and a social sense. And so the subsequent questions are, you know, how does this neglecting of the repository affect the ability of waste management organizations to do their job? And what are the potential consequences? So these are logos from the Swedish organization, the Canadian organization, the French organization, and obviously the US DOE for um, their own nuclear waste projects. So this project has impact in terms of all of these. Uh, communities. So the case study that I started with is looking at what happened at WIF. So most of you know about this. This is in New Mexico. Um, it's an assault bed. It's licensed to host a very specific kind of waste from Department of Defense activities, transuranic waste, not plutonium from dismantled nuclear weapons. It's a very specific type of waste. And it's been operating uh, some, you know, pretty like peacefully co coexisting pretty well with the surrounding communities since the 1990s. Um, the waste is stored in these drums down and then the salt will actually cave in over it and sort of emplace it for 2,000 years. In 2014, there was an accident. Um, so this accident had a release of radiation from the site. This is a picture of one of the drums and there was an explosion, but no one was harmed and there was no like radiation put into the groundwater and sort of permanent uh, legacies. And this was, in, uh, the accident was a result of the fact that somebody essentially wrote organic on a piece of paper versus inorganic. And they wanted an inorganic material to surround this waste in this area. They put organic material instead, and that caused a reaction that was not desirable to occur. And so, you know, in terms of like organizational theory accident theory, you know, this is a very like normal type of accident that would happen in an industrial setting where you just have poor communication and misunderstanding that propagates down the line and then ultimately res results in something catastrophic. It resulted in the site closure. Um, this is a picture of air monitors being in place. Um, it's now accepting waste as of this year. But um, so, you know, it was closed for four years, effectively. And so, you know, some people have said, like, oh, we've learned a lot from this. And maybe we have, but then, you know, so under the Trump administration, there's a lot of talk about let's actually expand the purpose of WIP to, um, you know, include plutonium. Um, keep excavating something. And that was talk being talked about while this facility hadn't even reopened yet. So you can argue that maybe they're not actually doing anything. But so I would say the lessons from what for other repositories are, you know, can be summarized as like don't count your chickens, right? You didn't demonstrate compliance. You, they, you know, the compliance was supposedly for 10,000 years, but in the first couple of decades they had an accident with a radiation release. So it's not just about geology also, right? It's the suitability of the surrounding area to handle these unavoidable accidents. Um, and, you know, what is the different sort of training for decision makers, scientists, et cetera, who are designing plant versus people who are actually working at the plant, which are, you know, effectively sort of like mining type of operations. Um, and, you know, a question too is why is this still an acceptable risk for that community and how can we apply that? So I'll leave you with my final example, which is the Nuclear Waste Management Organization in Canada. So they learned a lot, their takeaway from the US process was that consent was really important and it was not obtained in the United States and in Canada you have to obtain consent. So their main variable that they're prioritizing right now is finding a community that's willing to host the repository. 
Uh, the geology is important, but it's not really, you know, it's not the main factor. The main factor is the community has to be willing to host it. And so the potential sites that they're considering are a lot of indigenous communities that are right mm -hmm. along this Great Lakes Basin. And so, you know, this is, these are the questions I'm considering now with this case, which is, so, yeah, okay, these, will, these communities are willing to host it, right? A lot of them are willing to host it. Um, but how, are, how is this organization considering the newer term other than the sort of social as acceptability aspect in its process? So technically, in terms of operations, if you look at what they're showing on their pages and talk to people who are uh, involved with the organizations, it doesn't seem like they're considering it at this point. And so a question you might pose is like, if the same sort of accident that happened at WIP happened at one of these sites um, and had a radiation release, what would this mean for this region, um, which is, you know, a very different reason, region than so a desert in New Mexico? I'm going to interrupt because I'm sure people would love to ask a question. And there's yeah, one I, have, I have one slide left. Okay, so, so there's no questions. Yeah, thank you. So um, considering, you know, the environmental impacts of having this, like, what, you know, what are the impacts of having a uh, waste repository in this region, no matter how suitable the geology might be or how willing the, the community might be to accept it? So uh, I will leave you with these conclusions, and I guess we don't have time for questions. No, but that's that fast. 30 second question. <laughs>
Another one is the observed reliability. So not just the cost, but sort of how uh, available is the electricity? When does it go down? How long does it go down? On two of these uh, grid connections, and these are two different things. One is a, a diesel generator on the island, and the other one is a, a wire going over the um, water to the island. And then the last thing is uh, some work we did trying to understand the relationship between the delivered cost of electricity, the amount of photovoltaic assets that it, you have to install in order to get a given level of reliability. Uh, and is there a sort of reliability cost trade-off that could be useful for putting out more electricity in these areas? Um, so first with the diesel cost survey, basic question, what are the actual delivered costs? Do they match expectations? Um, a well-maintained diesel generator requires about 300 milliliters to consume, to create a kilowatt hour of electricity. Diesel costs about a dollar a, a dollar a liter, so you can quick. So the marginal cost of this electricity is about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. We're paying something like 15 cents here, um, so it's a little bit more expensive. But in island communities, it's easy to transport. It's the best game in town. Um, oftentimes, however, these diesel generators are oversized for a number of reasons. You might want to not have something that's going to black out or cause capacity problems. Uh, but that oh, that reasonable decision to oversize the generator can cause them to operate in efficiency and can cause other problems. What did we do? We installed some meters on grids. We got fuel use from operator logs. And then uh, because the generators were actually of uncertain lineage, we tried to create sort of like a statistical model of your average generator. And then, um, so this was creating sort of a statistically uh, valid generator for different rated powers. And then this could give, this is basically an efficiency graph where we can see the fuel consumption based on the uh, power that the, um, generator is delivering relative to its rated power, and when you're at lower powers being delivered, you are actually, even though the fuel consumption is less, the fuel consumption per kilowatt hour of electricity is much greater and therefore inefficient. So we're trying to figure out how close are we to that 300 number. And so and this was all sort of linear models uh, where you've got, this is the generator, even if it's uh, using no, if it's not uh, having any electricity, drawn from the generator, there is still an amount of fuel being used. Just like your car, if it's idling, uh, is still using gasoline. And your mileage is infinitely bad. Um, so we did this, so blue is a hypothetical statistical uh, model of a diesel generator uh, that is matched to the size of the grid and is appropriate. The green is a generator uh, that is in perfect condition, but is at the current size, which is oversized for the grid. So the difference between the blue and the green line is showing you a, a small but significant penalty for having an oversized generator. Now the difference between the green and the red line, this is what we actually observe. And so uh, we think that there's, and so that penalty is much greater. Right, so it appears that fuel is just being spilled onto the ground. It's sort of hard to believe that these numbers are this bad. Um, but one of the things is that uh, in the literature, if there are, um, if you have oversized, you can have incomplete combustion, which causes a polymerization of the fuel on the walls of the cylinder and can lead to really bad degradation. So it sort of does make sense that you could have um, fuel consumption per kilowatt hour that can be three, four, five times higher uh, than uh, what it should be. So the main thing that I would like, the impact I would like this to have, and there's a little bit of anecdotal impact from my uh, colleagues in Indonesia, that the people that are making some of these planning decisions don't understand that you're actually seeing these sorts of fuel consumptions and they're really thinking that the fuel consumption will be this. So just demonstrate, just gathering that data could have an impact on some of these planning decisions. And try to avoid that sort of status quo bias. There's lots of good reasons to use fossil fuels. They've served us well for a century. Uh, but uh, there's lots of evidence saying that we should move on. All right, so a little bit on observed reliability. Um, how does the observed reliability compare again? Is it what we think it is? Or is it much worse? Is it better? 
Uh, are remote grids performing to our expectations? Um, and is, can you call something a grid if the reliability is actually quite poor? So we had another set of a, a very similar methodology. We have, here's a picture of the meters we install. So because of the magic of computing, right, you can have very tiny meters doing data logging, remote telemetry. You put that on the panel of the, um, of the distribution panel, and then you can collect time series over time. And then so you, can, you see this sort of daily cycle, but then you can also see these blackout events. So you can go through and you can um, filter out those blackout events, decide how often they happen, the frequency, um, and then what the durations of those are. And then you can sort of compare those to your expectations and to uh, sort of published uh, recommendations from uh, organizations like the World Bank. So what does that look like over time? So we took these time series and we created a, a sort of one Boolean, true there's electricity, zero uh, false Boolean, averaged all those, and the microgrids don't operate during the day. This is what we expected um, because it's not economical to run those small diesel generators all day long. But then even at night, they're only getting into sort of the high 80s of the percentage of the time they're on. Right, so imagine if your internet was in the high 80s for reliability, uh, there would be riots in the streets. Uh, but that's sort of what they're expecting, again, but the end, this is at a very high cost. So low reliability at a very high cost. Uh, the grid connection actually has something, you know, dipping down below 90% reliability, even though they're connected to sort of citywide areas. Um, and then they have an overland cable, and, and the, the poorly uh, colored line at the very top is some preliminary data from uh, the PV systems, which appears to have very good reliability, and this could actually be an underestimate, because we're using a really clumsy method to determine whether or not that grid is up, and I think the actual, when we get better sources of data from the power system blocks themselves, I think that reliability will increase. So now we, we're not able to normalize for cost yet. I'll talk about that in a second, but um, at least we're demonstrating that these PV connections from private providers can have a higher reliability. And that data, again, is very rare to come by. Um, all right, so the observed reliability in terms of uh, two uh, variables we often use called uh, the, well, SADI and SAFI. Uh, system adjusted duration, system adjusted frequency. Uh, these are the numbers. Uh, you don't have a lot of context, except that you know if you had this is sort of 300 is sort of on the order of one outage a day. That sounds pretty acceptable for unacceptable for most of us. Uh, these this tier five is the recommendation from the World Bank. The World Bank is sort of asked. What is the amount of electricity that should be provided to aid human development? And they sort of said, this is not a binary thing. There are actually tiers. At the highest tier, we call it tier five. That's the grid. Uh, what do we want that um, to look like? And so as far as the duration, it's in the ballpark. But as far as the frequency, these outages are happening much more often than the recommendation. So again, is a grid a grid if it's not actually giving you the level of reliability you might expect from a grid? And then that, so we'll move into this next question, which is, should energy source comparisons also include reliability? Often they include cost, but should we be normalizing for reliability to have more accurate comparisons? So that gets into some other work and then some work that people have built on this work. So uh, first, a very sort of, sort of simple technical problem. Uh, how is the cost and reliability affected by the amount of battery and panel size? Uh, you can have lots of panels and we'll have lots of electricity. You won't have it to store at night. By the way, solar electricity, worst possible technology you can use for getting light at night. You need a battery in order to get any lighting whatsoever from solar electricity. Uh, the more, panel you, the more uh, battery you have, the more um, autonomy you have is the word we use, which is basically the, mo the more cloudy days you can deal with. Uh, so are we designing for a cost-effective -effect reliability target? So we did some uh, modeling, and we came up with a cost per kilowatt hour curve as a function of the panel and battery size. And we basically said, OK, if you're at 90% reliability, and then you go to uh, two nines of reliability at 99%, you're looking at something like a factor of two cost increase. 
So if it's acceptable to have something between 90 and 99% reliability and the costs work out, is that something that you should consider in your planning decisions? And then other researchers uh, built on this and they had a data set that looked at the reliability across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and they sort of asked, if you match reliability to the given level of reliability, are you at cost parity? Right, so in most of the world, uh, solar is more expensive than fossil fuel sources. But again, if you match for a given reliability, um, are you cost competitive? And their modeling says that um, yes, in some areas, you could be cost competitive in this sort of blue regime within uh, some sort of, within you know, kind of a one decade type time frame. Uh, and again, an interesting thing about PV is that it's, it could be possible with modular designs to incrementally add uh, this uh, generation, these generation assets. So the future work, uh, we want, I want to continue the reliability observations for PV and microgrid and make these comparisons, see what these reliabilities look like. Uh, we have a grant starting up looking at the intersections of mobile technology, energy consumption, and soft costs. Uh, which are going to allow us to sort of understand how leapfrogging type technologies and digital technologies can help deal with um, some of the sort of maintenance costs of electricity. And I'm also, we're also interested in the behaviors of newly electrified uh, communities. I am unqualified to measure socioeconomic impacts, but we've got a grant with some folks that are. And so I, I'd like to sort of understand the socio-technical behavior, and then others want to uh, understand the socioeconomic impacts. But we've got about a thousand sites coming online, and so we think that we are going to be in a position to perhaps answer some of those questions with the statistical power of those extra sites. So. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be back here at Stanford. Um, you're all seeing warm in this very cold room. Um, I'd like to mention my funders, uh, California Energy Commission, the UC Davis John Muir Institute of the Environment, Center for Biological Diversity, and also the College of Ag and Environmental Sciences at UC Davis. And a lot of this work could not be completed without our industry partners, including Aurora and NRG, SunPower, and HelioPower. So I think Caitlin set the, um, the stage to ask this question and have you guys all reply accurately. Can I get a show of hands how many of you have used up any land today? Used up. Mm -hmm. Used up. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what most people don't realize is that uh, by using um, any of their electronic devices, um, that you, you in fact are using land and all energy supporting human activities requires land both directly and indirectly. And throughout history, well, I, and I should say that um, currently today, energy development is now the largest driver of land use and land cover change in, in the US. But throughout history, the nature and magnitude of land use for energy um, has really um, changed dramatically. So pre-industrial or organic economies relied on biomass um, that drove deforestation and, um, and required large areas of tree plantations um, to support human populations that were far smaller than today. And while the second half of the 19th century was notable for the emergence of coal, the 20th century marked a dual transformation in the rise of total energy consumption, which was an order of magnitude greater than in pre-industrial times, and also in the use of carbon intensive sources of energy, uh, coal, oil, and natural gas for electricity. And for the first time, uh, these impacts of energy on land manifested in direct, indirect, and latent modes along very complex, nuanced, and often intractable supply chains. Um, 
So imagine the accounting challenge of calculating the land use and land cover change for a uh, infrastructure and supply chain like this, which represents the United States natural gas infrastructure. By the end of the 20th century, the rise of nuclear power, the technological breakthrough of fracking, and uh, renewable energy has really relegated the dominance of fossil fuels to be one of many energy options within a global, uh, globally very diverse portfolio. And as you all know, here we are today, about 80% of our total energy con consumption comes from fossil fuels. And 10% um, still relies on this same source of energy as early humans did, um, and 10% are uh, modern uh, renewables, solar, hydro, and geothermal. So how will we achieve our 100% uh, renewable goal? And Stanford, as you know, is a place where this uh, discussion has been, um, there's been a lot of ferment um, here about the commercialization of, of um, these energy types. Um, but I argue that we need to apply knowledge and experiments from ecology to understand the limits on land and on ecosystems. So for example, landscape ecology um, and the sloth debate, single large or several small, really helped shape foundational spatial relationships in optimizing reserve design. So the rapid transition from carbon intensive sources to renewables really requires new data. For example, what rules exist for the siting and shape of solar energy infrastructure and their proximity to protected areas? How do we avoid the unintended consequences um, upon nature as we fail to do with coal, oil, and natural gas? A lack of understanding of this is problematic in that we make uh, a lot of our siting decisions, uh, like Caitlin mentioned, without consideration of the ecosystem controls, feedbacks, and trade-offs that uh, come when we develop solar energy. For example, how well did we integrate our understanding of, of soil ecology, of plant function, of ecosystem services, to determine if a project like this was sited in a way that actually optimizes our decarbonization goals. This is a picture that I took uh, in Puerto Viano Photovoltaic Park um, in Madrid, just south of Madrid. It represents the fourth largest solar energy installation in the world, and it's also sited right in the middle of a biodiversity hotspot, which is known as the Mediterranean Biodiversity Hotspot. So in my lab, a motivating question for our research is how do we meet our rapid renewable energy goals while maintaining our need for food production and conservation? And one answer, as this is a complex problem, is to understand the ecology and sustainability of solar energy across natural and human dominated landscapes. So in one study, we are borrowing methodology from landscape ecology and meta-analysis to quantitatively evaluate the land use intensity of the major sources of electricity. So we combine geospatial analyses of the footprint of 498 individual power plants, um, including the area needed to source the fuel. Uh, with real world, these are observed generation um, based data across these same power plants over a fixed period of time, so this is one year. And we find that the land use intensity of electricity uh, varies by about four orders of magnitude across these uh, energy types that are the dominant sources of energy that we use for electricity. So you can see here that the largest bubble uh, is dedicated biomass, so that's about 60,000 hectares per terawatt hour per year. Natural gas and coal are on the same order of magnitude um, as surprisingly solar concentrating power and also ground mounted PV. Geothermal is very small and nuclear is also even smaller but rife with problems <laughs> as Caitlin mentioned because 
this does not include actually the land use for disposal in this calculation. Uh, wind is surprisingly large. That includes that spacing in between the different turbines. And hydroelectric, as you might um, anticipate, um, is larger at 11,000 hectares per terawatt hour per year. One dot that you might find missing in this figure is integrated solar. And that's because solar energy uh, that's developed within the built environment incurs no uh, land use. Right? If it's mounted on a rooftop or on a vertical surface, it's integrated within the built environment, it's already incurred those land use and land cover change impacts. Next slide shows this same data, except um, we then consider both the environmental impact from the land use intensity with the greenhouse gas emissions. So on the x-axis, you can see greenhouse gas emissions from zero to 1,000, and then on the y-axis you can see the land use intensity. And what you see here is a sweet spot of where we are optimizing both land use and um, greenhouse gas emissions. So um, what we wanted to do is quantitatively determine um, in California, how well are we citing these utility scale solar energy installations? Um, so what we did is we mapped um, about 160 installations and by land cover area. And what we found was that there's a lot of missiting being done in that um, if you look on the x-axis, the number of installations, you can see the number of installations and on the y-axis is the land cover type. And the plurality of the installations are located within shrublands and scrublands. And so these are our California this is our biodiversity hotspot. This is our California floristic province biodiversity hotspot. So the same kind of things that we saw um, in Spain. And another important takeaway of this figure is that there, we are emphasizing cultivated croplands and pasture and hay. And so this has important implications for impacts on our food production here in California. Okay, so this figure represents um, another important pattern that we're observing, especially in California and other places in the West, is that the, a lot of these installations are being sited close to protected areas. So this figure represents three different protected areas, uh, federally protected areas, endangered and threatened species habitat, and inventoried roadless areas. And what we see here is that most of them are within five and seven kilometers of a protected area. So is that close? Is that far? <laughs> well, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and then Hamilton et al. Um, use development buffers of 5 kilometers, 25 kilometers, and 75 kilometers to quantify impacts on protected areas from urban and agricultural development. And so we can see that these are, in fact, close and within that uh, buffer that we should be noting and, and concerned about. Okay. So moving on, recognizing that solar energy development can be a driver of change in natural environments. In a follow-up study, we're evaluating the impact of site preparation on the largest concentrating solar power in the world, um, and particularly on desert plants with, their, um, with respect to their values to uh, humans using a plant-centric value system. So we established three treatments. Um, in each power block of ISEGS um, that represented different site preparations, um, heliostat configuration and density, and a management strategy also for rare plant conservation. So these treatments are bladed, mode, halo, and control. And that halo, that might not kind of ring a bell, but these are basically um, rare plant micro refuges within the power blocks. So what we found was that site preparation and moderate, uh, moderate to high heliostat density had negative effects on diversity and abundance of a valuable desert plant species within the value system. We found for the perennial plants, which these are yucca and cacti, that the halo and control um, uh, plants were a lot higher than what we observed in the bladed and the mode. This is an invasive species that we me measured, 
And what you can see here are that the bladed treatments are facilitating the recruitment of this invasive species that is um, implicated in spreading fires throughout lots of Southern California. This is Schismus arabicus, if you um, know the plants. So holistically, we will use these results to evaluate whether development actions associated um, with the construction and management um, of ISEGs will align with or conflict with the established value of, of native desert plants, but also with respect to their cultural, ecological, and societal, societal values um, in the same kind of vein that Caitlin is exploring. Thank you so much.